Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar from the Society of Conservative Lawyers on coronavirus, has the rule of law been overlooked? My name is Ed Ludlow, and I've been asked to host this event from a technical point of view, so I will be running things from here. Um, if there are any technical queries during the session that I can feasibly help with, please do get in touch with me via the chat facility and I will endeavour to help you if at all possible. Um, just to say that this is the Society's first webinar, so while we're certainly not envisaging any problems, um, these technical problems can happen, so in that event, please do bear with us. We will not be using the facility to raise hands during this session, but if you have questions that you'd like to submit to Sir Bob or the panel, please send those in via the question and answer facility or the chat window. Um, I will then filter these, provide them to Sir Bob, and he will then select the most relevant speaker at the end to answer. Uh, we will not be unmuting people other than the panellist and Sir Bob as chair. Finally, I'd just like to inform everyone that we are recording this session with the hope of putting it online afterwards, and there may also be some screenshots taken uh, as publicity after the event. Uh, I will now hand over to uh, Matt Gass from the Society, to introduce things on behalf of the society. Uh, thank you, Ed, and for all your help uh, putting this together. Um, so yes, I'm the Deputy Chair for Research in the Society of Conservative Lawyers, and I want to thank everyone on behalf of the society for joining us for this, our first webinar. Um, I want to give a special welcome to any non-members who are joining us today. If you find the event interesting and would like to attend more like this in the future, or get involved with research, then I'd inc strongly encourage you to join the Society by visiting our website, www.conservativelawyers.com. A big thank you to our distinguished panel for being with us today and for all the research they've been carrying out in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. All of the papers and articles being discussed today should be linked or available on our website. And in particular, I'd like to thank Sir Bob Neill, MP for Bromley and Chislehurst, for chairing the webinar. Uh, before becoming an MP, he served as leader of the Conservative Group on the London Assembly. Uh, he was knighted in the 2020 New Year's Honours and has recently become very used to hosting virtual meetings as chair of the Justice Select Committee. Over to you, Sir Bob. Well, thank you very much, Matt, uh, and welcome uh, to everybody. I'm a member of the Society myself, of course, and used to practice at Two Bedford Row. Um, so uh, important issues for all of us. Uh, and I'm really grateful for everyone who's participating in this. Uh, we're a, the Conservative Party is a party that believes in law and order, but it also believes in, in pragmatism. Uh, and part of the objective for today is to work out and make sure that we have a proper discussion about how we deal uh, with the issues which confront any government, but do so in a way which respects uh, that commitment uh, to the law. Can I just introduce briefly the panellists uh, by name, so you can put a, a name to the voice. You've got their CVs uh, in the, the joining pack, uh, and they'll then go through uh, each uh, of their presentations in turn, and then we'll have some questions after that, which are being sent in uh, via Ed, as you had explained. So I'll introduce them in the order in which you're going to hear for them. Uh, Andrew Blick, do you want to say hello, Andrew? Hello there, everyone. Uh, and next we've got, uh, we're then going to go to Robert Craig. Good evening. Uh, then to Rachel James. Hello, good evening. Uh, then to Lord Sandhurst. Hello. Hello. Uh, Welcome, uh, as David Frost used to say. That's it. Uh, then to uh, Roman McCorkin. McCorkin. Hi, hi, everyone. Good evening. And then uh, Bennett Brandreth. Hello, very good evening to you all. And last but not least, Francis Hall. Good evening, everyone. Well, the background to, the, to what we're discussing, of course, as we know, are regulations that the government brought in uh, consequent upon the Coronavirus Act of 2020. That itself went through Parliament in record time uh, and was a piece of emergency legislation in response to uh, an unprecedented emergency situation, which I think we all concede that government had to move swiftly uh, to react to. Uh, and we recognise that. Uh, and what we're going to hear and talk about now is uh, the legal basis and some legal analysis of those regulations and how they fit with that balance you have to strike between decisive action to protect life and the need to observe uh, and uh, protect 
that the rule of law are on the other hand. And you're going to hear differing analysis uh, and different views, perhaps, uh, as to how well or otherwise those regulations meet those tests. But the one thing that we're all clear about is this. This is a crisis, there's a public health emergency. It is hugely important uh, that everybody continues to observe uh, the guidelines on social distancing and all the other matters which have been set out, follow the expert advice. And although uh, some of us may be expressing views one way or the other uh, about uh, uh, legal merits or otherwise uh, of some of the, of the regulations and how they were achieved, none of us is suggesting that you ignore them. We all must continue uh, to follow uh, the guidance and to follow the regulations which do have the force of law. So that's the caveat that we all want to set out before we embark upon what I think is an important discussion and analysis of how we got here, what the legal process is, what we might learn for the future should we have to embark upon legislation of a like kind uh, for the future. So without more ado, can I now go over to Dr. Andrew Blick. Thank you very much. Good to be here. We're proceeding swiftly, so I'll get straight into my talk. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm speaking uh, today is uh, not because I'm a lawyer, because I'm not a lawyer, I'm actually a constitutional historian, but my interest in this subject matter is very much from a constitutional perspective. What does the way in which the government has approached this, uh, this undoubted emergency, taking powers that is undoubtedly needed, that we should adhere to, as was just said, what does that mean from a constitutional perspective? I have recently had a paper with uh, Professor Clive Walker, who is a lawyer, published, uh, talking about this, and talking about, in particular, from the point of view of a piece of legislation, we're both interested, Clive and myself, uh, the, the um, Civil Contingencies Act 2004. Now, the reason that's interesting is because the government chose not to use the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 in the context of this present emergency. And when you read through the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, it looks like it was drawn up precisely for this kind of emergency, amongst other kinds of emergencies. It has a list of the kind of emergencies it might be used for, one of which is, is a, a, an outbreak of some kind of epidemic, some kind of pandemic, exactly the kind of thing we see now. So when it was drawn up in 2004, it was uh, envisaged that it could be used in precisely these kind of circumstances. Part two of the act, which has never been used and there was speculation about when it might be used and really if it was going to be used, it would have been now. Part two of the act allows for the government, for ministers to issue as statutory instruments, uh, emergency regulations, which can amend or repeal existing legislation and have the same status as, as, as acts of parliament. Uh, they're still subject to the Human Rights Act, so they can't actually uh, alter the uh, European Convention rights, but they do have that strength. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of reason why, uh, though the 2004 Act could not have been used. And I find that constitutionally interesting. Why was it not used? It's not entirely clear. I think a, there's a possible limitation is that one of the limitations of the regulations that can be used under part two is that they can't be used to alter the rules of criminal proceedings and i think that the coronavirus act 2020 does enable uh the kind of link up we're having now to be used in in court cases including criminal cases so maybe that was a reason although i think that could have been dealt with by separate primary legislation if if that was what was needed so it's not entirely clear but one of the consequences of uh, the 2004 Act not being used is that the kind of uh, parliamentary controls you've got in place are a lot weaker. The 2020 Act uh, lasts for two years, although even then the uh, a, a minister can extend it. And every six months, the House of Commons gets to vote on, uh, on the proposition that the, the emergency regulation should stay in force. So as we see it, that's a fairly weak uh, kind of lim parliamentary limitation. And, and again, that's not to say I don't agree with what's being done at all or that the government should have powers, but I'd like to, personally, I think a, a, a stronger le limitation from Parliament would be useful. Also, the reporting procedure is pretty vague about what ministers are actually, according to what criteria the ministers actually report on the way in which the Act is proceeding. So those limitations, we compare it to what's done in the 2004 Act, the regulations introduced uh, remain, in, uh, have to be authorised by both Houses of Parliament within seven days of being passed and after 30 days they cease to have effect. Now Parliament can then 
replace them with new regulations, but, but that they do only have 30 days of effect each regulation issued. So you can do a lot with them, but they are time limited. They're subject, and Parliament can also uh, alter them or abolish them at any point. And there's, there's also more of a role for the House of Lords than there is in, in the regulations on the Coronavirus Act. So those were the main points we made in our article. We think that's constitutionally significant. We also think that the fact that an act that was drawn up in, in 2004 in times where we weren't actually in the middle of the crisis and which was looked at by a joint parliamentary committee and, and looked at in detail in draft form is probably a better way of creating a statutory framework, not doing it in the middle of the crisis itself, but actually drawing up a framework in times of relative calm rather than actually devising a, devising a whole new system when you're in the middle of the emergency itself. So we felt there was, there was an interesting question there about that we're going to need to answer going That's forward. Exactly. Because I suspect, unfortunately, there are going to be more emergencies in the future. So let's let's think about this. Would be would be my final conclusion there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. It's interesting, actually, as I recall it, the original the, the, the bill was originally drafted didn't have the six month review clause, uh, and the government accepted um, a cross party yeah. amendment that a number of us were keen to press and yeah. accepted it with good grace. I have to say, and um, pretty swiftly, perhaps they yeah. done the maths. Um, but it is interesting that that. May indicate that perhaps the speed at which it was drafted or so on but anyway yeah, that's yeah. that's where it is now but you're, you're quite right now over to robert craig then what's your take on it thank you um very much to um anthony spake for organizing the event and to sub neil for sharing and laying the groundwork i'll be discussing the virus of the legal regulations announced by the government uh, the main point i want to make today uh, concerns that oops, let's do the next slide <laughs> Um, yeah, concerns the scope of the regulations recently passed by the government uh, using Section 45 of the Public Health Control of Diseases Act 1984. The structure of the empowering uh, provisions fully respects the long-standing constitutional doctrine of separation of powers, as famously demonstrated in Entick and Carrington. Entick established the general principle that the government may not interfere with the liberty or property of the individual without legal authority and independent approval by the judicial branch. The 1984 Act allows for people who may be infected to be subjected to some very serious restrictions by magistrates formal application, um, uh, after a formal application, excuse me, um, and hearing. I've got a phone call on that. The Act does not grant any such powers to the executive directly. It allows for the secondary regulations to be passed if the situation is too urgent for the normal procedure. Crucially, the Act limits the powers that the government can ever exercise so that they are less extensive than the powers magistrates have over individuals who may be infected. The most sensitive of the powers possessed by magistrates are expressly denied to the executive by the Act. The Overton window has moved enormously in recent weeks, but many will recall that public policy before the crisis assumed that it would be impossible to enforce general compliance of the public as a whole for any highly draconian restrictions. Indeed, the famous pictures of crowds out on the first sunny weekend in March, uh, strong, after strongly worded advice had been given in the UK, appear to reinforce that policy assumption. In my submission, and this may be controversial, the successful implementation of a general lockdown was only really made possible by the eerie news reports and pictures on our TV screens of a province of 60 million people in China being shut down completely for months. Those images flashed around the world. The 1984 Act is steeped in the old mentality before the Overton window shifted. It refers only to restrictions on potentially infected people. So does the, um, so, so does the uh, Coronavirus Act 2020, incidentally, most of which was drafted long before this crisis peaked. Nowhere does the 1984 Act even contemplate a general lockdown of the entire British public. Just imagine the level of crystal clarity of wording that would be required in normal times for such a draconian power to survive the legality principle in Sims, particularly when exercised through secondary legislation. Magistrates certainly cannot order such a lockdown of the entire general public under the 1984 Act. The idea that the Act contemplated that the government could do so when the drafters expressly limited the powers of the executive to be less extensive than magistrates' powers seems to me to be untenable. If you step back for a second, the idea that a mismatch of sections 45C1, 45C3C, 45D4D and 45F2 
could be cobbled together to justify such an incredible exercise of power stretches all credulity. Yet these exact provisions are cited in the preamble to the regulations. Crystal clear, it is not. In a written statement published on Tuesday, 28th of April, the Health Secretary formally announced that a review had taken place on 16th of April within the required 21 days and reiterated five conditions before the restrictions can be relaxed. Strictly speaking, none of the five conditions can plausibly be connected directly to the application of special restrictions to potentially infected individuals under the specific terms of the Act. It seems that the government is therefore standing by its bold interpretation of the 1984 Act. Nor did it see fit to remedy the absence of any appeal mechanism the other day when it issued some amending regulations. Which I'll let you read quickly. That's it. An opportunity for individuals to appeal against a restriction imposed on them is an express statutory requirement under Section 45 F6. A right to individual appeal may seem odd in regulations that purportedly apply to the entire British public, but that simply illustrates the start of the regulations and the empowering provisions in the 1984 Act. In conclusion, these regulations confer the most draconian powers ever seen in peacetime. They have not been conferred directly by primary legislation. The regulations appear to exceed the scope of provisions conscientiously drafted to respect the classic constitutional doctrine of the separation of powers, and in particular, the right to independent judicial scrutiny of measures that seriously affect personal liberty. There is therefore a strong case for arguing that the regulations are ultra vires, the 1984 Act. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. I mean, it's certainly good, isn't it? We, we, we saw one prosecution very, very early on up in the northeast of England, which didn't end very happily, if I can put it that way, which does indicate um, that, that the uh, professional district judge uh, was in difficulty um, yeah. uh, with coping with some of this. And there may be lessons to be learned, but be, because the way the CPS effectively um, had it relisted and we drew it, perhaps some of those issues never got to be tested, um, but, but it certainly raises uh, uh, an interesting and important point. Uh, in terms of regulations themselves, Rachel Jones, Rachel, you're going to take us through some of overview of, of all of that, so over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, as Sir Bob said, I will be speaking about the lockdown regulations in England, so that's statutory instrument number 350 of 2020. Along with my Blackstone colleagues, uh, Emma Dixon and Tom Hickman QC, I co-authored an article about these regulations on the 6th of April, and that's available on Blackstone's website for anyone who wants to read in more detail. The key features of the regulations include the restrictions on the free movement of every person in this country, that's regulation six, and that contains a non-exhaustive list of reasonable excuses to leave one's home, and the restrictions on public gatherings in regulation seven. These rules are enforceable by forcible removal from, um, from the outside to one's home, fixed penalty notices, and unlimited fines upon summary conviction, and that's regulations eight to 10. My co-authors and I have argued that the regulations are likely to be ultra vires, but I say no more about that this evening in light of Robert's talk. We also suggested that the regulations create, created potential but not indefensible arguments around human rights. We noted that one exception to Article 5 of the Convention is preventing the spread of disease and we argued that the government's assessment, as at the time the lockdown was imposed, that restrictions on liberty were needed to protect life, were unlikely to be second-guessed by a court and many countries have followed the same path. On the 22nd of April, the lockdown regulations were amended and I wrote an article about the amending regulations on the same day, which is also on Chamber's website. The amending regulations were presented as clarifications by the government, but they actually added an entirely new offence. Previously, Regulation 6.1 prohibited any person in England from leaving their home without a reasonable excuse. The amending regulations have added that being outside one's home without a reasonable excuse may break the law as well, even if you had a perfectly good reason to go out in the first place. In my view, in light of the above, there are three problems with the regulations as they currently stand and four potential refinements that I would suggest. Problem one is that the concept of reasonable excuse is inherently subjective, and so it gives much discretion to the enforcing official. Added to this problem is the ambiguity in the text, which creates a rule of law concern, especially in light of the amending regulations. 
i.e. especially now that merely being outside is a potential offence. If a person leaves home with the reasonable excuse of purchasing food, for example, how do they know when that reasonable excuse runs out and ceases to protect them from enforcement? I note that the amending regulations in Wales have added a different new offence here, to remain away from one's home without reasonable excuse. Problem two is subjectivity in the enforcement provisions in the regulations. No reasonable, no reasonable belief as to an offence is required to trigger forcible removal to one's home. If the official considers that you are outside without reasonable excuse, and the official considers that it is proportionate, they can forcibly remove you to your home. It's not an objective test. Problem three is the differences between the four nations of the UK. For example, in Wales only, the reasonable excuse of taking exercise is limited to once a day. The English regulations do not contain social distancing rules. The Scottish and the Welsh regulations do. So turning to the four possible refinements that should be considered, they are first, is there more tailored language that could meet the objective of the amending regulations, which added a new offence to regulation 6.1? There was a gap in the law before the 22nd of April. If a person had left home with a reasonable excuse, on one view, they could thereafter stay outside indefinitely, which seems clearly contrary to the regulation's purpose, i.e. the lockdown and the public health imperatives underline it. However, the solution that the government has chosen here is very broad. The second refinement is to limit the re relevant persons who are allowed to enforce the lockdown to police officers, as is already the case in Scotland, and the government could also add a reasonable grounds test to the enforcement powers so that enforcement is less, uh, less discretionary and less subjective. Third, give these powers clear parliamentary authorisation. Robert's already talked about why the 1984 Act is not sufficient for the English regulations. And fourth, explore whether the differences between the four nations are objectively justified. Why is exercise limited to once per day in Wales, for example, but not elsewhere? However, I would note in conclusion that we have to be mindful of devolution concerns here in respect of health and or justice, as the case may be. Thank you very much, Rachel. That's an interesting point. Actually, one of the points about reasonable excuse arose in the local government context in a meeting I was in. There's a lot of discussion. A lot of all local authorities have closed down their refuse disposal sites and they're some now completely reopening them. But there was this question, it's a reasonable excuse if I go to the shops to uh, get food. Suppose I put in the bottles that I have accumulated during the lockdown to take them to the bottle bank, which is on the way to the shops or is a short detour or around the back, you know, does my reasonable excuse of getting food still avail me um, uh, when I go the extra 200 yards to a quarter of a mile to the bottle bank uh, uh, to, to dispose of it? Uh, and actually it was a, a conundrum that local authorities actually grappling with in one of these issues they take all as to, to actually do uh, ease up around the, the, those sort of provisions. So it makes the point, well, it crops up in day-to-day in -day issues for, uh, for people who are running, running these operations. Okay, that's very helpful. Over then to Guy Sandhurst. Thank you, Bob. We face, as we all know, a public health emergency which calls for drastic curtailments of our accustomed freedoms. But it's the very drastic nature of those curtailments which makes it important that government gets the regulations and the guidance right. The concern which I'm addressing in this talk is that the official public guidance which purports to set out the scope of the effect of the legislation is inaccurate and ought to be clarified. Sadly, government hasn't clarified it, even though it's had time to do so. It has promulgated misleading claims as to the regulation's meaning and effect, and it hasn't put it right. The guidance goes beyond what the regulations say. In important respects, it represents as mandatory things which are simply, in fact, wise advice which the government would like us to follow. Ronan McCormacain explained this in his blog, When is a Rule Not a Rule? He points out there are lots of things that government tells us we ought to do or not to do, not to drink too much alcohol, or conversely, to eat plenty of fruit and vegetables. But those are not mandatory rules, they're simply good advice and guidance as to how we should live our lives. Now, 
what I want to do now is look briefly at the regulations and then show you why the guidance is wrong. Regulation 6.1, in its newly amended form, has that during the emergency, no person may leave or be outside the place where they are living without reasonable excuse. And in Regulation 2, it says that a reasonable excuse includes the need to do certain things. And I shall now look at the two most significant examples of what those things are, which are given as examples of reasonable excuse. The first given in the regulations is the need to obtain basic necessities, which are described as including food and medical supplies from any business listed in the regulations. It's interesting that such permiss permitted businesses expressly include not simply supermarkets, but off licenses. The second example of what may be a need is the need to take exercise. So note first that the regulation is in non-exhaustive terms. It says a reasonable excuse includes the need. If I can look first at shopping for basic necessities, nothing in the regulations in fact limits what the supermarket or off-license may sell to you. If I go to Sainsbury's to stock up with porridge and lavatory paper, and it also sells flowers, I can buy those. I'm also entitled to buy vodka, tonic, and crisps. Nothing in the regulation says that I may only exercise once a day. An individual, I suggest, particularly if currently unable to work, who is living in a small flat, quite possibly without children and without, with children and without a garden, can quite sensibly justify going out in the morning and for an evening walk and on a fine day, possibly in the afternoon as well, and possibly for 20 minutes, possibly for an hour. And that's to preserve mental well-being as well as physical well-being. But what does the government guidance say? This was published on the 29th of March, and it hasn't been updated. It's headed Coronavirus Outbreak, FAQs, What You Can and Can't Do. And the text begins, one, when am I allowed to leave the house? It answers it, you should only leave the house for the very limited purposes. Shopping is described as shopping for basic necessities. For example, food and medicine, which must be as infrequent as possible. Well, alcohol certainly isn't one of those. Flowers bought in a larger supermarket wouldn't be basic necessities. Exercise is said to be one form of exercise a day. But as I've pointed out, Regulation 6 contains no provision as to the frequency of visits to shops. And it was even more seriously inaccurate for a cabinet minister to say, that shopping had to be confined to shopping once a week. And the sort of problems we get are when the Chief Constable, the Chief Constable of Northamptonshire, incorrectly said, before he corrected it later, that he'd have his constables looking in, the, in his people's shopping trolleys. Well, that was obviously quite wrong. And of course, it flowed from the fact that the government guidance was clumsy and wrong. Finally, if we look at exercise, there is absolutely no restriction in the regulation as to frequency of exercise. So it's unhelpful for published guidance to present as mandatory what is simply guidance. This was all done in a hurry. We understand that. This is likely to continue for a while to come. My plea is that government can and must do better. It would do well to read Ronan's blog. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Garvinat. That segues very neatly into Ronan, actually, to Ronan Cormacain, who's going to uh, develop what's in the blog, I'm sure, uh, and perhaps some more. Ronan, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for the chance to speak to you this evening. Um, I would, by way of background, at the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, where I'm a research fellow, we have been investigating some of the rule of law issues around the COVID-19 legislation. I would like to make discuss three main points, if I may, in my talk. 
So the first one is that the rule of law still applies during the course of the emergency. And that's probably the single most crucial point. And then flowing on from that, the second and third point is to do with the process of making that law and thirdly, the, the structure of that law. Um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to see some of the slides as we go along. So the, the first main point then on the second slide is that the rule of law still applies. Law does not fall silent amid the clash of arms. I'm quite sure that all lawyers here will be familiar with the, the words of Lord Atkins in Never Siege Against Anderson. Uh, whenever he made his dissenting judgment, he was talking about the emergency of the Second World War. But he said very clearly that law still has a function of playing. And that principle applies in this current public health emergency, as it applied in that emergency. And that's part of the British constitutional system, as well as being reflected in international law, for example, in the ECHR, the ICCPR, and the Syracuse Declaration on Principles for Derogations in Public Health Emergencies. So that's the key thing. We're still governed in accordance with law. So all the things that we've been discussing so far, sensible guidance that a minister might issue, or information that he might give out at a press conference, or NHS advice, or police officers saying what we ought to do, those are all still important things, but they are not law. They are guidance, advice, encouragement, aspirations. Those are all things which should properly form the content of the law, but they should not be elevated to the level of law itself. And if we were to get through this virus, we need to make sure that we recognize that we are ruled in accordance with what the legislation says, rather than simply by what a minister may or may not say. So flowing on from that point then, the next slide looks at the principles for making that law. Now, it seems quite clear to me that the best way of regulating the situation is by legislation, because it is only in legislation that we can have a proper, comprehensive and holistic way of dealing with the emergency. Yes, case law and the decisions of judges in individual cases will be important for ironing out any wrinkles or for implementation or for interpreting any ambiguities. But we can see from there, the breadth of the Coronavirus Act, for example, at 300 pages long, that it aims to set out a comprehensive system for regulating the emergency. And how ought that to be done? Well, it has to be done, as Bob has already pointed out, by proper parliamentary debate and scrutiny. Parliament has agreed to it. It voted on the Coronavirus Act 2020. Yes, it was done in a very curtailed fashion, and it was rushed through Parliament very quickly, but it was still subject to proper parliamentary scrutiny and debate. The same principle applies to the statutory instruments that we've been discussing. There is an opportunity for Parliament to accept them or reject them. And part of these principles is that the legislation, the process should also be transparent. So the, pro, the way in which we make the legislation should be transparent. The nature of the scientific advice which informs the legislation should also be, sat, should also be transparent. So one may question, therefore, for example, the membership of the SAGE committee and whether it is a genuinely independent scientific body or whether it has some political um, influence within it. The final point then, which I would make is more a structural point, if we move to the next slide, on the content and the structure of that law. We've already mentioned a key point that the legislation should be time limited. So it already contains a sunset clause and as already has already been pointed out, it also contains a pr procedure for review after six months. And again, yes, this was a point inserted as a part of the parliamentary process. But the second point is that it must be proportionate to the ends sought. It's not a carte blanche to government to do whatever it wants in order to stop coronavirus. Both within our domestic jurisprudence and within international jurisprudence, there has to be a, a definite causal link between what, you're, what you are doing and the ends sought. And related to this is that the legislation must be strictly limited to the purposes for which it has been enacted. Um, and we can see bad examples of this if you look globally, for example, in Hungary, where the law is being used for all sorts of nefarious purposes, which aren't really related to combating coronaviruses, coronavirus. 
So I would say to conclude that the emergency laws must be kept separate and distinct from the ordinary laws so that they don't infect the legal process with their quite oppressive and draconian uh, measures. And there's some further information on these points on the website that I've referred to, the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ronan, for that. I'm going to give a, a shameless plug to the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, because amongst other things, they give the admin support for the all-party parliamentary group for the rule of law, which I've taken over as, uh, as chair of. Um, so that's my uh, advert for the night. Um, but they do great work in that regard. So I'm very grateful for that support, actually. So are all my colleagues on that APPG. Um, Bennett, Bennett Brandreth, over to you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I am one of the co-authors of the Society's paper, yeah. uh, which raises a number of very serious concerns about the statutory and regulatory approach that's been taken to dealing with the uh, C-19 crisis. And I think you have heard uh, this evening those concerns echoed by other speakers. Indeed, uh, though we come from different perspectives, uh, one of the things that appears to unite us is a belief that something has gone wrong here. Tonight, I just want to make two points. The first is to emphasize the need for the position to be reviewed properly and adequately and placed on a proper basis. And that need arises uh, for philosophical reasons, and by that I mean that respect for the principles of the rule of law, uh, respect for limits to intrusions on the lives of citizens, uh, and requirements for clarity, proportionality, and due scrutiny. These things become more, not less, important in times of crisis, because crisis can overwhelm the normal safeguards unless they are jealously guarded. It also arises for practical reasons. The severity of the crisis demanded a response that includes what are, by any standards, extraordinary intrusions onto everyone's lives and liberty. Now, we don't quibble that restrictions are needed, but because they are so severe, it is vital that they be clear. And you have heard, these are not. They will be challenged. Indeed, I understand that challenges may already have been commenced. And no government should want to be held to have acted unlawfully. But perhaps to my mind, the most important practical matter is that the government is asking people to enforce these rules. And those people deserve protection when doing so. If the government wants a community support officer to use force to return someone home, then that community support officer should not have to fear that he or she is committing a tort when doing so. And that therefore brings me to the second point that I want to address, which is what we put forward in our paper is the route to uh, putting everything on a sound footing. Now in our paper, which is linked to it in the invite, and I, I strongly ask you uh, to read it because the detail is captured there. We looked at what we, and I think others, considered to be the problems with the current position in order to identify what was needed from any solution. As I say, the paper contains the detail, but in summary, we say six matters will need to be addressed. First, there must be provision for a sound legal basis for the regulations, and that cannot be found in the 1984 Act as it stands. Second, that legal basis should provide for all of the nations of the United Kingdom, and absent good reason, the regulations should be consistent across the United Kingdom. For example, in Wales, the regulations do restrict you to exercise once a day, but not so in England, and we don't know why that difference exists. The fourth point is that the regulations must be proportionate, precise, and predictable in their scope and application. That's not just so that they're lawful, but so that people can follow them. Fifth, there should be adequate provision for parliamentary oversight and for the extraordinary powers under the regulations lasting as long as needed, but no longer. The sixth is that provision should be made to deal with the period prior to the sound legal basis being given for the regulations. Now, as I say, amendment of the Public Health Act 1984 will not do. First, it doesn't apply to all the nations of the UK. Second, its context is not this particular crisis or indeed any crisis of this scale. And it is therefore an inapt vehicle to address the difficult and controversial issue of retrospectivity and the necessary scrutiny of restrictions of the kind we now contemplate. In contrast, 
the Coronavirus Act 2020 is legislation specific to this current crisis, inherently limited to and targeted at the needs of this current crisis. It is therefore well suited to explain the context for retrospectivity and to match the limits of time and need for the extraordinary powers contemplated by the revised regulations. Furthermore, it's applicable across the UK and yet acknowledges the role of the devolved governments. And finally, there is within it already a mechanism for review and revision that might be co-opted to bring about the changes that are, in my opinion, so necessary. So in our paper, we propose there should be an urgent review of the Coronavirus Act 2020 and amendment of that act to meet the concerns our paper raises. We also suggest that the right vehicle for holding the ring in the meantime is the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 for the reasons given by Dr. Blick. So the summary of my position, and I think of our paper, is that something must be done and can be done, and that not to act is itself a choice. And that's my talk. That's very clear and extremely helpful. Thank you very much in, in, indeed. Uh, and then if we move on to our final panelist, Francis Hoare. Good evening, everyone. Um, I should say at the outset that I am instructed in a matter which raises issues I'm concerned by the regulations. Um, I am talking, though, um, on matters and opinions that I've given in a paper that's already in the public domain and is linked to the webinar um, address. And I'd urge everyone, if they can, to read that. Um, proportionality has been mentioned by Bennett and by others, and it's key not only because all um, regulations that are secondary instruments must be um, compliant with the Human Rights Act, but also because in the 1984 Act, if these provisions are virids, if they are permitted to be made under that Act, and I agree entirely that they aren't, but if they are, they must be proportionate. It's important that at this stage to emphasize the distinction between that and the Human Rights Act. Under this Act, they must be proportionate, a positive. Under the Human Rights Act, they must not be disproportionate, um, uh, disproportionate interferences with convention rights. That's quite an important distinction. Uh, in my view, uh, it is too easy, and I think too easy perhaps because we're, we have internet and we're able to go out and we're able to go to parks, but it is too easy, I think, to underestimate how extreme these measures are, how unprecedented they are, and how much of a violation they are of the freedoms protected by the Convention, which reflect freedoms we have taken for granted in this country for hundreds of years. Um, the um, authors of the Blackstone paper mentioned that Article 5 may be, um, may be engaged that is the right to liberty, may be engaged by these regulations. And it may be engaged because there is a recent finding by the Supreme Court that restricting individuals to their house for most of the day could engage that article. Um, that she is of the opinion that it might be said that, that, was, um, a, a, that the qualification in Article 5 might apply. I disagree. The qualification in Article 5 allows in this respect, the lawful detention of persons for the prevention of spreading of infectious diseases, um, and so on. Um, it is difficult, if not inconceivable, to think that the authors of that regulate of, of that convention right had in mind the um, the the, uh, the 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 re remaining in people's homes and enforcing that. Eight is obviously engaged, that's the right to um, a family life and a private life. Article 9, the right to religion, is engaged because individuals cannot go to worship in churches and mosques. Very concerningly, Article 11, the right to association and assembly, is engaged clearly because nobody can go and meet and protest. That's important particularly because of the muted protests there have been about these regulations um, in the press and elsewhere, although perhaps public opinion is changing. Article 14, the right not to be discriminated against, clearly engaged when one considers that those who suffer from mental health 
conditions. Those who are subject to domestic violence, which is disproportionately women, are disproportionately affected by regulations that they require them to stay in some flats with no gardens and no access to, or limited access to parks. Uh, um, Article one of protocol one, the right to property, clearly engaged because businesses will lose their value as a result of these regulations, which is the test. And Article 1 of Protocol 2, the right to it. Many children are not being educated. Let us not forget that. A whole generation of children are having their, um, are potentially having very grave destruction given to their education and far too little is said about that. Why is the breadth of the regulations important? It's important because when we consider proportionality, we are customarily told when we look at convention rights, that there is a margin of appreciation and that margin of appreciation is particularly important when it comes to the government following scientific advice. Um, the Syracuse principles have been mentioned and they require restrictions relating to public health emergencies to be the least restrictive. They are important and so are proportionality principles in general. But then we look at what the government has done and we see that it is imposed, fettering its discretion, I have suggested in my paper unlawfully bettering its discretion by imposing tests which take no consideration of any, any matters other than the coronavirus spread. That, I have suggested in my paper, is clearly not applying the test of proportionality that is necessary. Because the test of proportionality must weigh the, the effect of these regulations on the coronavirus and uh, the effect of these regulations on rights and freedoms. And also, of course, the public health effects and the effects on the livelihoods and well-being of people in the future. How that test should be applied, I don't answer tonight, but I do suggest that much more needs to be focused on it, and hopefully will be. Okay, Francis, that's very helpful. Thank you very much indeed for that too, very, very trenchantly. Uh, put. Okay, well that, that, that's our panel of speakers and so as we said we're now open uh, for questions and you've got the function there where you can submit the questions and I will read them out um, and Ed and I will work between us uh, to try and re read out the questions um, uh, that have uh, come to us uh, and uh, let, 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 let me start with uh, one that's a, a practical one that I've already uh, seen and it may be we can deal with this one quite quickly, but it's from Andrew Thompson, a barrister, who says, who bears the burden, the burden of proving a reasonable excuse? Um, unless I'm wrong, tell me if I'm wrong, I assume, like any one of these cases, if the prosecution prove the fact that you're out of doors, doesn't the burden then shift to the defendant to show that he's got a reasonable excuse, Rachel? Put on um, the civil standard? Or do you think they both have to prove both elements themselves? What do you think, Rachel? Go, so for the questioner's original question about who has the burden of proof, yeah. there's a, an interesting, if you're very geeky, difference here between England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, which okay. is another one of those differences. Tell us about um, so as I read the English, Welsh and Northern Irish regulations, you're, you're quite right, Sir Bob, that the burden is on the prosecution in, a nor in the normal way to show that I went out without a reasonable excuse. Yeah. In Scotland, reasonable excuse is expressly made a defence. Right, I see, yeah. So it's a statutory defence under those circumstances, right? Yeah, under the regulations as they apply in Scotland. Yeah, is this Scotland. one of those examples of why the differences between the nations might yeah. actually be quite practically important. Right, I get you, yeah. So anything else on that one? I think that's, that, 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 that's fairly straightforward. Um, here's a point from uh, Ginny Torelli. She's asking all of you to, for, for, for comments, those who wish to. And she says, the public seem to be extremely worried about the special, the quote, special restrictions uh, and requirements, end quotes, under the new law, um, under the 2020 Act, I think she means by that, um, uh, via the 84 Act. How worried should they really going to be? Should they really be that they're going to be removed or detained uh, to a hospital for screening or potential uh, disinfecting, etc.? cetera? Um, it would appear that the likelihood is extremely low. Has it even occurred? I don't think it has, is the answer to that last bit. Um, but, but what about the, the legal? Um, aspect of the concerns that she raises there. Any observations on that? Well, is that conflating two things which need not in fact or should not be conflated um, in relation to these regulations and the 84 Act? Uh, Robert, do you want to come in? Just, just very quickly to say that the Coronavirus Act 2020 
to a large extent duplicates um, the powers set out in the yeah. So to, to, to the extent that there were to be a situation where someone was to be uh, physically detained, it would probably be done under that act rather than the regulations yeah. today. Um, but, but it hasn't happened yet precisely because the situation where someone might need to be removed for medical attention, the person being removed is likely to be quite keen for that attention to be granted, the medical attention. So it hasn't been a problem so far and it does seem unlikely that there would be one thing. Yeah, because the 84 Act still applies, it's still running, so you could use that as appropriate. Okay. Um, v, which is again asking everybody, so it's open to all. Um, it's a, she makes the statement, the rules are clearly incompatible with our human rights. What can we do? What's our recourse? Uh, does this go to judicial review? I, I think, Bennett, you may have uh, hinted already that uh, probably proceedings, actually, but it's a JR of the uh, effect that's underway or, may, or maybe underway. That, that will be recourse, wouldn't it? Indeed, they could be challenged in that way. Um, and uh, as I say, I understand may well have been uh, challenged in that way. But of course, one of the problems that I've raised, uh, a concern that we uh, have in our paper, is that there might be a, a direct suit brought against the person doing the enforcing, yeah, this is uh, uh, who would be said to be acting unlawfully in uh, using force, for example. I think I saw that uh, Dr. Cormack can have yes, indeed, his hand. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, Ronan, would you like to, to add to that? Yes, I don't think it's clear cut that they are absolutely in contravention of human rights. I think built into the idea of human rights is a balancing act within them. So it says that the state can take measures which would interfere with our human rights in the protection of public health or for the protection of health. So it's not an absolute right or there. So the right to freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, etc., isn't an absolute right. And I think everyone would recognize that those rights can be fulfilled during an emergency. It's just a question of where exactly the balance lies in that. Okay, yeah, Rachel, what do you think? I think Rachel's still muted. Rachel's muted. Yeah, can we unmute uh, Rachel, please? Rachel should be unable to unmute herself, I think. Sorry. Rachel, are you? Yeah, Rachel, you've muted yourself, so I can't. Sorry, un... hello? There you yeah, go. Yeah, there you are, Rachel. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, I think there was a double unmuting effort that yeah, was yeah, colliding. So, so um, <laughs> we're going to have to get used to double, <laughs> double unmuting as a thought, uh, isn't it? Yeah. To, to echo Ronan's point, really, I think there are quite interesting arguments either way on the human rights questions. And my co-authors and I went into this in quite a lot of detail. Um, I think you can make very convincing arguments, um, particularly Article 5, which is really the key, the key right engaged here. I mean, um, we can speak about all the others, but they have much more explicit balancing exercises at the forefront. With Article 5, what we're looking at is whether you can fall within one of a limited range of exceptions. And I think, um, in, in my view, it's not nearly so clear-cut as, um, as Francis's very persuasive presentation would have us believe, but obviously that's the art of advocacy. Um, one, one question here is a real politique question about how much courts are going to defer to the expert assessment of very difficult um, yeah. expert evidence, which is, you know, we're, we're lawyers, not scientists, but um, that, that is a, a, a real open question. Yeah, can, I just, uh, can I just can I just yes, you want to come back in, yeah. you, I yes. think we have to distinguish between two issues here one yeah. is whether or not the restrictions in and of themselves not to go out not to meet and so on are in violation of the human rights uh, right. of uh, the citizens there is a second question a kind of supervening question about the quality of the legislation the clarity the proportionality of the regulations itself yeah. that engages a set if I may put it that way a separate question about whether or not there is a human rights issue. And I think it's important to keep those two separate so that you may think that there is, as I do, uh, an importance to proportionality and clarity in the regulations, whilst also thinking that actually in the circumstances we find ourselves in, uh, some of the rights that we are uh, guaranteed bends to the crisis. Uh, and I think there is, there is a variety of views as, as Rachel and Francis and others have indicated. Yeah, that's right. And actually, that, that leads me into a question that I've, I've had that's been sent in. Um, it was directed at Francis, but it links also to what you've said. But it, uh, are we perhaps ignoring, when we talk about the human rights dimension, are we ignoring the human rights implications of the pandemic itself? That's a really interesting question, because um, I, I argued in my paper 
um, contrary to others. And in fact, there's been a response to my paper, a very, a very well-written response, which I'm not going to deal with in, in, in detail now, um, saying that Article 2, the right to life, does, does have some sort of requirement on government to act. Um, it, it was my view in the paper that that was a difficult argument to make, given that the exceptions, the, 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 the case law so far has not envisaged anything nearly as broad as this. And it relates to, for example, cases have been cited um, at the, the Russian cinema, uh, which people may remember um, the Russian police used um, gas to yeah. um, make, put people to sleep so that they could move to, um, hostages and terrorists. Uh, and in that respect, it was suggested, it was found by the Australian court that there was a positive duty on the state to act to protect life. That, that it seems to me, is very different from a situation where one is requiring the whole population to stay in their houses to protect against the, right, the, the, the risk of infection, which may be quite high, but of a, of a disease that for the general population has a very, very low mortality rate, certainly relative to Spanish flu and other things. That, of course, opinions would differ on that. Okay. Right. Uh, Robert, you wanted to come in on that one, and then Ronan. Robert. No, no, I was, uh, it was a, it was a... You're, you're covered on that. Okay, Ronan. Just in response to Bennett's point, I agree absolutely that there's two separate questions here. The one is to do with the form of the law, and the second one is to do with the content of the law. So in terms of the form, then there's a lot of issues around clarity predictability, accessibility of those regulations. And I think there is a lot of criticism that probably could be leveled at that. Uh, but then the second point, which perhaps we were discussing more broadly, is the content. So whether or not it is proportionate with respect to uh, the right to liberty, for example. Yeah, OK. I've got a, a couple of questions we're going to link together. One's from Lindsay Kaplan, as, as a couple of others. Um, if we feel it, that it is uh, disproportionate, and, and I'm, I'm reading the question as a government backbencher, I am not saying this, I'm merely being the conduit, um, uh, and we wanted to bring action against the government that's coordinated, how would we do it? I mean, is that the sort of thing where you, you talk about class actions and other things? I, I, I simply lob out, is that the sort of thing that's uh, practical in these circumstances, realistically? Watch this space. <laughs> okay, that, that's, yeah. I would say, I would say that, that although I understand where the question comes from, certainly in writing our paper, yeah. our purpose wasn't to generate a series of lawsuits because exactly. yeah. we come from the perspective, and I think many people do, the caveat that you read out at the beginning indicates it, that uh, some form of restriction was justified or may well have been justified given the crisis. What's important, we say, is that people know that that is... Uh, coordinated in a lawful, clear uh, way. So what we are proposing is a way to put things back on the right footing. And, and for that reason, in our paper, we have raised the, as I say, controversial issue of retrospectivity. Uh, and it is a very controversial issue, and, and that's why we think it has to be dealt with by primary legislation. But I, I don't think it follows that because we're saying there is an issue here, that we are saying that the issue is necessarily with the restrictions themselves. That comes back to, to Ronan's very clearly made point about the difference between form and content. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Ronan, did you want to add a point uh, to that? Yes, um, perhaps the difficulty with having a collection of lawyers is that they think that the solution to all problems is to go to court and argue mm -hmm. about it in a court. Um, but I think probably I would agree with Bennett, the correct forum for arguing and debating these things is probably Parliament. If we think there's a problem with the regulations, then we can lobby Sir Bob and ask him to use his best endeavours to see that the law is changed in some way. And I think in this situation, courts would probably have a quite a lot of deference um, to the executive in their decision-making role in properly assessing the scientific advice. And I think that would be problematic for a legal action to succeed on that basis. Okay. Guy, did you want to come in on that point? And then we will come back to, to Bennett. The, um, judicial reviews, if you've been picked up and sent home, is a rather sledgehammer to crack a nut. Mm -hmm. One of the problems which we've identified in our papers is that, first of all, there's an unclear basis for the quasi-arrest powers when one looks at the regulations. They're not yeah. satisfactorily drafted. We suggest there should be a, a look again at <coughs> the quasi-pace approach. And secondly, 
we point to the fact that you can be fined summarily, effectively, by the police officer, um, yep. and there's no power of appeal as we read it. Um, unlike if you're locked up um, in quarantine under the 1984 Act. Um, so there are simple things which could be done, um, yeah. which aren't there, and which we don't want to have everybody going for judicial review. No. Okay, Rachel, anybody on there? Um, again, I really wanted to just echo something Ronan said, which is about the <laughs> different spaces for debating the substance of the restrictions. Um, and obviously Parliament is going to be debating the regulations and the amending regulations on Monday, as I understand it, Sir Bob. Yeah. Um, but there is a real difficulty at the moment when Parliament itself is affected by a crisis, mm. which I think almost all of yeah. us accept is an ex exceptionally pressing public health crisis yeah. that presents a real risk to health. Because um, the, the key principles in Ronan's, Ronan's talk, which I think we can all subscribe to, might not apply fully at a time when it would be difficult to ask parliamentarians to gather en masse and vote on some of these issues. Um, so I do, I do throw out there for the consideration of others how we reconcile our commitment to parliamentary scrutiny with um, a situation where, as I understand it, we don't yet have virtual, remote, uh, virtual or remote voting protocols, for example. Right, yeah. well, interestingly enough, we were um, members of parliament were doing a test remote voting um, this afternoon, so, so I, uh, I voted in a division as to whether or not we prefer spring to autumn, um, <laughs> just to, to see if the technology works. But I think it's got to be approved by the procedure committee before it can come into force. So it's not far off, but not yet. Um, Bennett and then Robert, and then we'll perhaps move on to another question. Just very briefly to, to say that this discussion that we're having now reminds me of the point that uh, Andrew uh, Blick made right at the very outset, mm. yeah. which is that it is extraordinarily difficult to draft this le legislation accurately, clearly, uh, yeah. in circumstances of crisis, which is why, given that there was an act mm. drafted with cool, yeah. calm heads that was supposed to provide you with the thinking space in order to do the job more carefully, it's disappointing that wasn't used. It's also, it must be said, quite disappointing to see the recent amendments to the regulations, which appear to pay no attention to what we, I imagine, uh, rather uh, selfishly and uh, self-regardingly assume was quite a big uh, swell of people from a whole range of different backgrounds, political views and so on, saying this is necessary but you haven't got it right. And, and none of the points that we have raised variously in our ways appear to have been picked up on at all. Instead, further complexity and confusion has been introduced. That's disappointing. Okay. And Robert, do you want any, any further points on that? <laughs> Pick up um, very quickly on the point about retrospectivity. Um, the point about retrospective law is that, as in the Razian sense, is that you can't plan your life if you don't know what you did now. Yeah. Is Absolutely. Yeah. That's not this situation. If there was a retrospective underpinning of what's happened in the last few weeks on the, under the regulations, nobody would have been put in an unfair position. And we've got to remember that also Raz says that the rule of law is but one value amongst many political values. And therefore, in a situation like this, where there is an overwhelming public desire to, to do the right thing, um, where the perspectivity point has much purchase. Okay, that's, that's a very interesting point. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to move on to, uh, we talked earlier about quality of legislation uh, and guidance, and, and here's a question from Robbie Owen from Pinsett Masons. Um, does the panel consider that the use of guidance generally is increasingly being abused as a form of soft law? Is this an example of a general trend, uh, the members of the panel think? Any views? Is that, mm -hmm. is that a political one, maybe? <laughs> Guy? Uh, or my recollection is, I've forgotten, it's Lord Hoffman, or it's Lord Bingham, isn't it? Who said, um, I've forgotten the case, but we referred to it now, um, that the gu guidance is not law, and it's not the same as regulations. Um, that was in, I can't remember if it's the House of Lords or the Supreme Court, but it was on that sort of period, around about 2005. And he said it, oh, it was in the context of the, um, of Article 5, and um, so Rampton, I think it was, yeah, yeah. And, this, and, and, and what was going on there. And, and the, the guidance that was relied upon was not the same as regulations. And I think he's got a very good point. We've got to be yeah, totally yeah. careful here. Yeah, yeah, this is. Yeah, yeah. Raise, raise up. 
Yes, I don't know if it's getting any worse. I think certainly during this crisis, the guidance has been abused as a form of soft law. And, and I think it's something that we should always be jealously aware of whenever we are investigating yeah. legislation, this idea that we should have regard to guidance, but that we must follow the law. I think it's something, a, a line which is always at risk of being blurred, certainly by the executive. Yeah, okay, Rachel? I think one thing that's worth bearing in mind as a kind of general principle is that government obviously has various tools at their disposal to achieve the same end. Um, and personally, I would prefer that the criminal law, criminal enforcement, fixed penalty notices and so on um, are measures of last resort. And if that's so, um, then the use of guidance obviously has a very important place. And I think the difficulty comes when guidance is not clearly distinguished from the law or even worse, when guidance is being confused for what the law says. But in principle, and I think I can speak for my co-authors here relatively competently when we wrote our long article, um, we endorsed the public health guidance and we encouraged everyone to follow it because yeah. it was the best available expert guidance at the time. Um, and nothing we as lawyers say about the ultra-virus nature of the regulations or anything should detract from that, in my view. But the difficulty is if a government is presenting public health guidance or something that can be backed up by the criminal law, that's for me the difficulty. As long as the guidance is clear that it, it is guidance, and so for example, your health is less at risk if you go out less frequently, I have no problem at all with that as guidance. It's just when, as, as Lord Sandhurst was saying, the guidance and the law are confused. Yeah, okay. That's, uh, albeit I was a criminal practitioner, I think you're right about this, this time, times when the criminal law does or doesn't have a, a, a place in these things. Uh, there's a, a, a number of questions that have come in uh, from a number of people about whether or not you could, I'll paraphrase the question, but whether a mandatory vaccine for all citizens is legal. Let's say, could you use these, these regulations or the 2020 Act as it stands uh, to make a, to compel people to have a vaccine? It raises all manner of human rights and other issues you can think of immediately, can't you? Um, I suspect the answer is no, but what do people think? Any, any views on that? Never mind the political desirability or um, practicality. I don't think there's anybody thinking of doing that. I has to have to say in government at all. Let, let, let me put that caveat in straight away. Um, I don't think it would, would it? It seems to be the general view here. I so yeah. disagree. Is there? No, I, I think that's right. No. no, you couldn't do it to, to do that. I think we're, we're all saying that. Separate one, um, should the uh, UK follow other countries and derogate from their obligations under the ECHR, assuming in this context? Um, having been on the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, I'm, I'm very wary of getting in personally, of getting into um, derogations from ECHR, but generally where we have talked about it, it's been in relation to national security issues, uh, things of that kind, which one can make a rather different case for, uh, but for something which is a matter of public health, an important issue. Um, should we be doing that? Well, it's, really, it's a, it's a political question, isn't it? Rather than a rather than a legal one. But if there's a legal aspect, Ronan, you... Sorry, Sir Bob, could I just jump in and say we're getting a number of questions about the timing. Um, yeah. I, it was originally billed as a seven o'clock yeah. finish, but I know Sir Bob's very yeah. kindly said he can stay on and take questions. But if people you know, in the audience would like to, to leave, please do. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much for attending. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We yeah. will go on answering questions for as long as the bottom permits. Yeah. Um, well, I do know some of the panel have to get away as well, so we, we'll probably have to wrap up fairly soon, um, but I'll perhaps take a couple of answers here and then see where we've got to, okay? Um, Ronan and Andrew, you wanted to come in. Um, just on the question of derogations, there doesn't seem to be a right or wrong answer. Some countries are derogating, some aren't. The one point I would make is that a, a derogation doesn't simply give carte blanche for a country um, to do whatever it wants in those circumstances. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fair point. And, and Andrew? And I, I presume that the, uh, the government is supposed to assess if what they're doing requires a derogation before they do it. Therefore, you know, the, that assessment process has taken place. They must have come to the conclusion that what they were doing doesn't require a derogation. But if, if a court was to, was to say otherwise, then, then they'd have to look at that again and, you know, perhaps issue other, other either amend the legislation or issue other legislation that, that, that did derogate. It seems to me the way around that would happen. 
Okay, yeah, Rachel? Um, it's worth noting that some rights aren't, you cannot derogate from certain rights in any yeah, event. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that, that's quite right. Uh, and then the final thing, very quickly, before we wrap up, if that's okay with everybody, um, uh, a question. Do the panel think the lockdown is affecting or will continue to affect access to justice? Well, fun enough, the Justice Select Committee is having some hearings um, around those issues. In fact, on Monday, we've got uh, two of the ministers in and the professions to talk about the impact on access to the courts, uh, uh, legal aid and justice. But any views here before we, uh, we wrap up? Guy? I mean, it plainly is, isn't it? Because there aren't any jury trials taking place. Yeah. The president exactly. of the family division has said that the more complex care cases involving yes. Munchausen's by proxy also can't be tried. Well, the idea that they should be put back six months with a child who might need to be taken mm, yeah. into care or taken away from the mother is pretty grim. Yeah, yeah, but fair point. Barry, Bennett? I mean, uh, uh, Lord Sanders gives the obvious uh, yeah. extreme examples, but I think actually the impact is going to be uh, much broader than that. If you think about it simply in terms of even minor civil matters, oh. where in order to be able to effectively access the courts, you have to be able to remotely do so, there are going to be large proportions of our population who are particularly needful of access to justice who simply lack the capacity to remotely access the courts. And I think that is a point of considerable concern. I don't pretend that I have an answer to it because there is the countervailing need for uh, distancing. But I think it, it's very hard to say, and I know that the judiciary are working extraordinarily hard yeah. along with the court service to make it as possible uh, for everyone to attend as, as they can, but how it cannot have an impact, I, I simply don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, well, I'm going to use chairman's privilege and certainly say that all the evidence that we've had in our hearings to the select committee so far confirms the realities, of course it is. Um, and it's important, therefore, that we do find means uh, of preserving um, uh, access to justice and above all the infrastructure that underpins it. That includes the infrastructure of the legal professions uh, to be available um, to, to pick that up. Uh, and that the uh, Ministry of Justice, I think the, the Lord Chancellor, to be fair, said he was uh, certainly going to put in such resources as necessary, for example, to pick up on Crown Court hearings to move things along. But you may have seen uh, that Lord Burnett today was talking in terms of the possibility of going back to the position that we used in the Second World War of going down to juries of seven to see if in the aftermath this is a means of picking up the backlog. Now that's something that, again, the, the, the Select Committee will, will explore with ministers tomorrow, which is webcast, but it will require primary legislation. So the impacts are profound and they're not going to end um, at the moment the lockdown ends uh, either. So. That perhaps is not a bad note upon which to, to wrap up the questioning. We have run over time a little bit. I'm grateful to everybody for staying on. Can I think, uh, thank all of our very distinguished panel for what's been, I think, been absolutely fascinating discussion. Can I thank everybody who's listened in and particularly those who've sent in questions. I'm sorry we've not been able to get through all the questions, but we got through quite a number of the topics. I'm really grateful for all of them. Thanks to, to Matt. Uh, for service setting and Ed for dealing with all uh, the, the, the key technical sides of the really without you, Ed. Uh, and a plug if you're not a member of the Society of Conservative Lawyers, do please think about joining. Um, the website will give you details. Uh, you've got the links uh, to um, the excellent papers by Bennett and, and Guy Sandhurst, and also by Guy and Anthony Spate uh, on this topic. They're also on the Society of Conservative Lawyers website. And Guy and Bennett not content with those works together with Simon Murray of the Society and now turning their thoughts to a paper addressing the management of privacy issues which were likely to arise with a tracing app for COVID-19. So the Society is very busy as you can see on its research program and uh, I hope perhaps we'll have the opportunity to use another one of these webinars to talk about some of those issues. But So for me thank you all very much to everybody. Uh, it's been a, a fascinating evening. Very grateful for the time. Thank you, Sir Bob. Follow, follow the guidance. Thank you. Keep safe. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.